Welcome to uh, a conversation with Leslie Kish. Uh, this is one of a series of videos of distinguished statisticians that's sponsored by the American Statistical Association. I'm Bob Groves from the University of Michigan. I'm joined by Graham Calton from Westat, Rod Little from the University of Michigan, and Leslie Kish. Uh, we thought it might be good to begin by, by uh, saying just a few words about the multidisciplinary impact of, of Leslie's work and maybe a list of honors as it best. Uh, Leslie is a professor emeritus of sociology at the University of Michigan, but he was president of the American Statistical Association. He's an honorary fellow, a rare event of the Royal Statistical Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and an honorary fellow of the International Statistical Institute. He received the Lazarsfeld Award from the American Sociological Association and the Wilkes Medal from the American Statistical Association and the Sheps Award from the Population Association of America. And uh, in something we know is very dear to his heart, he received an honorary doctorate in statistics from the University of Bologna and was elected an honorary member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. My hunch is that if we ask the question of what do all of these honors have in common, there's only one answer and there's only one member of that set and it's Leslie, a, a truly uncommon man. Uh, there, have been a, there have been other descriptions of your life, Leslie, that have been published, and I thought it might be good if, if you could start our conversation today uh, just with a, a, a brief description of, of your early years and the, and the nature of your, your education. Uh, I hope I can make that brief. Uh, I intend to make it brief. I arrived as a 15-year-old. My father and mother, and I was the oldest of four children in 1926, New York. And uh, unfortunately, uh, my father died within six months unexpectedly. And we were left and had to go through a decision, the family, what do we do? I was, became a major decision maker at the age of 16. Uh, and we decided to stay in America, in New York. I finished eighth grade uh, elementary school in New York, Brooklyn to be exact, PS 128, uh, having, so I lost two years, let's say, due to language and transfer. And then I started night school and working at the age of 16. As then I finished with that, I decided I wanted college. So I started night college, which was City College of New York at night. I started engineering. My father was an engineer. Then went to physics, which I loved, but I didn't see any future in physics. I went as far as thermodynamics as a very good teacher. And then went through various things. But meanwhile, I was working, of course, only 54 hours a week. <laughs> for started at $90, went up to 110 that wasn't for an hour, that was for a month. Uh, and uh, at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. And I learned a great deal. What I the thing I remember most that I read R.A. Fisher about four times, each time learning something else, something new. And you, and there weren't many books available in the 30s about statistics. So why were you reading Fisher, working at the Rockefeller Institute? Oh, that's a very good question. It's young doctors were ahead of the statistics profession. They saw that the statistical methods for research workers was a thing to study from. So we were doing research involving rabbits, uh, constitutional variation in rabbits. They gave me my first idea about experimental design, but also the idea of a population that different kinds of rabbits had different resistance to tumors, particularly in other diseases. By the way, I didn't mention mathematics. That was really what I finished in mostly at City College. But there, wasn't, there were no statistics courses at night to speak of. 
I think I had two of them, and one in probability. By the time I took the probability and statistics courses, I knew more than the teachers. So I finished college when I came back from Spain in um, in uh, thirty nine. Now at that time there was really nothing much to read in survey sampling, is that? So None. Neyman's paper. Neyman's paper. Neyman's paper I read because when I came home I took two exams, passed both of them, New York City and and the um, federal government, and I chose the federal government, uh, although it paid five hundred dollars less. And then I went to Washington for the census. Uh, uh, 1940 census. I was in agriculture, and I took my first class in sampling with J. Stephen Stock, uh, Lester Frankel, and uh, Willie Cobb were the three people teaching it. And the chief thing, and it was Neyman's paper, and Neyman's paper, and a paper on the great unemployment surveys of the that these people, these three people, and Fred Stefan and others had worked on. So that, that's what, essentially, what we studied from. Well, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a misconception, I would say, amongst uh, some statisticians today that uh, survey sampling is a rather dull area of uh, statistics to, to do research in. You've kind of devoted your life to this area. I was wondering how you would uh, disabuse people of this notion. There was a job opening somebody told me about, new division called Division of Program Service. Mm -hmm. And I had an interview with Francis Lickard, who lasted an hour or more, and he inspired enthusiasm. He told me about this thing, and he asked me, would I do sampling? I said, well, perhaps I don't know what it is, he said. But, <laughs> uh, would you like to learn? I said, yes, and he says, power to you. Then I shook hands on it, and I started sampling. Mm -hmm. And then I took this course I just mentioned, which was the world's second course in sampling, uh, having started in fall of 39. Cochrane had taught one in the spring of 39 at Ames. Now, these were the two people, early names to be mentioned here. One is that the the Iowa, Ames, Iowa Center, Fisher had a lot to do with it, both because Fisher visited there, because Snedeker, others had visited Fisher in Rottenstead. And another name to be mentioned is Henry Wallace, who became uh, around, uh, vice president, he was secretary of agriculture at that time, who started this that lab with Snedeker. In a way, he was the senior guy, having given a series of lectures that started off the uh, first statistical laboratory, I think, in the United States at, uh, at Ames, Iowa. Well, what made it exciting for you at, in those days, and what kept the excitement in your life with yeah. sampling? All right, the first thing, because I got excited about sampling right away. My first job was to design Essentially, they were quota samples of farmers. And I learned very fast in three months that quota sampling doesn't work. Here's what happened. We used the quotas based on the 1930 census of farm operators to design quotas. So the, our interviewers, they came back, he says, we can't find these farms smaller than five acres in Wisconsin. They were farm operators, not farmers. So one of the things wrong with quotas is that the quotas are based on data which are old and wrong classification. At right. that time, wasn't that the main method that was being used in all surveys? And there was quite a debate, wasn't there? Yes, and Rensis Lickert was a proponent of probability sampling. In a way, it was inspired also by Henry Wallace, who started the Division of Program Service, to do use good, up-to-date statistical methods. Was it controversial at that oh, time? Oh, very much. About 52, there was a meeting of the American Statistical Association in Cleveland. There was a debate between Lickert and Gallup. This was a big debate 
in front of the American Statistical Association. And at the end of it, it was quite acrimonious uh, between Gallup and Lecker. And at the end of that debate, Gallup, George Gallup said, as long as I live, I'll never use probably this. <laughs> <laughs> I think a year or two later claimed that they are using it. You said earlier that survey sampling and probability sampling fit for you philosophically. What did, what did you mean by that? Okay, this is the subject. The idea of representing a population being a central scientific concept, and I think it is. It's a different way of looking at the whole world. You see, I think everything in the universe composed of populations. And populations, all populations, whether of people, electrons, complex, not simple. I had many arguments with great econometricians on the question of their models. So I lived with the notion of the importance of sampling. In these early days of the Survey Research Center, uh, after a group left Washington and, and came here. What, what was the atmosphere like? What, uh, did, did you have a sense that you were building something new? Or uh, were you worried about whether the enterprise would survive? It was a big risk, as, as I uh, read that history. Yes, it was a risk. The chief decision makers were Francis Lickert and Angus Campbell. We had uh, two or three offers, the group that wanted to leave Washington. So we want to go somewhere else. And Lickert had his degree, his engineering degree from the University of Michigan. So that and some people at the University of Michigan attracted us here. But it was a risk, uh, definitely. We were entrepreneurs. You remember I mentioned the name Lester Frankel? He bodily took the unemployment surveys in his briefcase to the Census Bureau. And that became the first current population. It was called the Labor Force Surveys. That became You mean 19th. he took the sample design? Yeah. I see. Yes, he was noted. Census didn't have sample. Till 43. But they were computing variances then. What, what, what year are we talking about? So, when? All right, so 43, they started consume current population surveys. So, sometime very early on, they started computing variances using with ultimate clusters, mm -hmm. like, like the called uh, primary selections. And they used collapse straight idea, which for computing variances ultimate cluster, an ultimate cluster idea, okay? So they, the census was computing, and by 45, say, they had a machine. I don't know when they started using the big machine, the UNIVAC. We didn't have a UNIVAC at agriculture, or sorry, doing it by hand. I computed some variances and found these. I divided by the simple random sampling. The idea was there, they just didn't have a name. So I didn't divide. I didn't invent design effect. I just adopted this child and gave it a name. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't an orphan. I was much impressed by it. And uh, later on, I reported on this to the sociologist on an article called Confidence Intervals for Complex Samples. And that made quite a stir. By this time, I was also teaching from 51. And I used both Cochrane and Hans and Herbert from Gallic proof, so you see, I, was, I couldn't wait for the book to come out. This was no. kind of an exciting time because those books were the first books to emerge. Yes. And so uh, there was Yates you mentioned earlier. Yates Hansen and Her 49, and I tried that. And I liked it very much, the students didn't understand mm -hmm. it. Then was, there was a Deming's book in 50 called Some Theory of Sampling, oh, right. mm -hmm. which had very good chapters, but it wasn't for a textbook. Mm -hmm. And then came Cochrane and and uh, Hanson Hurwitz. Mm -hmm. Now all of these are and personal had friends. An early one. And then Sukatni in fifty four, mm -hmm. which is also good. I used that yeah. too. But you they were personal friends. Did you have lots of 
correspondence and uh, meetings with them. Okay, so this is a small world, you know, we met not only in statistical meetings once a year, but I, I knew Cochrane from those meetings and admired him from papers, so I learned a great deal from Cochrane, wonderful person. And Hanson was, I can't tell you how important he was to us. He came and helped us even before we came to Michigan with advice and many discussions. I can tell you one where I was wrong and he was right in an argument. Hanson and Bill Hurwitz. So I would consult either by telephone or I would go down to Washington more rarely that he would come here. I went would, down to would these be on pro practical um, problems you were facing? Uh, oh, yeah. Practical problems they were facing? This was yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll take, for example, what's enough PSUs? And I said to Bill Hurwitz, 12, and said, that's about right. It's a, <laughs> it's a, minimum, it's a minimum number. Before that, it, what we had a it's probably the sample of household that they carried on during the war in their house, but a quota sample within the household by Quotas age and sex. By age and sex. Three ages and two sexes. In those days they only had two sexes. <laughs> 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 and I said, how about the random selection? Well, that was quite a fight I had on my hands. And at and that time was the Census Bureau using heads of household? They didn't have to. They didn't because sample? They, any. <laughs> as then any responsible adult, so they didn't have this problem. Any mm -hmm. responsible adult is what mm -hmm. they were using. I think mm -hmm. that's what they still use in current mm -hmm. populations. Mm -hmm. And why was agriculture interested in person-based samples then? It wasn't agriculture. It was we were in agriculture, but we were doing national samples of opinion. So there was that. There was another problem, and this is interesting. I got interested in the problem of non-response. At that time, there was a paper, uh, Bill Memorial Quarter, by a demographer, but it, there was no regular reporting on non-response, not by the Census Bureau either. Nobody, I couldn't. And I, I thought that if you have a public sample, you ought to report non-response. Now, non-response costs money. You mean to record it? Or to record it. You have to teach the interviewers the difference between an empty household Mm -hmm. a household with non a non respondent and a refusal and a not at home and a couple of other things doesn't speak English. Number two, if you report non-response and the other people, opposition, don't have any non-response to the sample, you're going to look bad. You already look bad. You're costly. And you're going to look worse. That was a hard one. And, but Lickert and Campbell came through and we started reporting. Uh, we did it first. Uh, it should have been a paper. And it wasn't time for it, but then it caught on. Leslie, you were talking about um, design effects, and uh, I was uh, fascinated by your arguments with econometricians about uh, the uh, impact of sample design on uh, analytical estimates. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Very much. I put more work into that than anything else, and it's very important to me. Now, first of all, why is it? I f learned fairly early on that sample surveys have to live and die by this central limit theorem and, this, and the, um, uh, the, uh, the limit. Uh, theorem <clears throat> uh, to, in order to make inferences, to make inferences from samples to population. So we knew what happens, we knew what happens in complex sur surveys and fairly on knew that what later on they got to call first order statistics and that means uh, uh, we're able to we could compute them from complex samples, but also knew that from means and difference of means, because we computed enough of them, there was a effect, design effect, meaning that the, the standard errors, you know, to make inference, were greater, generally, than they were for simple random samples. So we also had some pretty good inference for difference of means. I was interested interest in regression coefficient because my colleagues 
were using regressions on our surveys. This was not being done any place else that I knew of. I couldn't find any papers on this thing or any conversations. People were not doing it at the Census Bureau, for example. So I couldn't get advice on it. So what to do about it? Uh, meanwhile, I'm having arguments with the econometricians who went into denial. You know, our models <laughs> not interested. Never. Mind. So uh, I was really caught. I felt in a box. And then hap this is what happened. In '56, there was a paper by Deming in the JASA describing what the Census Bureau was doing about this thing, which was a replicated a randomization. So I went to the Census Bureau, and hardly anybody knew about it. Later on, it turned out that Margaret Gurney did the work, and our references to memoranda by her in 62 and 64. Uh, so what they were doing, we were, what later on I got to call a balanced repeated replication. I got excited when I read that. I, I made a speech here in the Detroit meetings in 57 to the Institute of Mathematical Statistics asking that for the development of um, uh, distribution theory for complex samples for things like regression coefficient being, being using that as example. Mm -hmm. Couldn't arouse any interest and meanwhile had this method and started computing. And my first computation of that kind was for a PhD thesis in political theory for Don Stokes, who was a friend, he later on become, became head of the Princeton and Woodrow Wilson, the uh, Woodrow Wilson School. school. Uh, it was his thesis, you'll find it. I did some computation and found the design effect. See, it's really hunting the existence. Does this exist or not? Is it, are the economists <coughs> right with their model? And I felt very strongly, being population bound, that there's going to be an effect. And in a paper in the JASA called Balanced Repeated Replication uh, for Complex Statistics, I think it's the title, 68, I read about some are four or six examples, begin including the Stokes. And McCarthy came through with balancing using the Plackett Berman paper. So from 68, Marty Frankel worked on it, and he had this thesis in 71. And that's what became the paper that Jim Durbin invited me to uh, uh, give to the Royal Statistical Society in 73, which appeared in 74 is the publication date. Uh, balance the Kishin Frankel paper. paper on balance to be replication. Then Tukey in a meeting gave that paper somewhere late 60s suggested the idea why this fancy balancing, how about just using jackknife, leave out one at a time. Tukey didn't remember later conversation, I remember very clearly he gave the idea. Uh, JRR and then um, also comparing with Taylor. By the way, that was very interesting to me because I didn't know which one would come out better. Possibly you know the results that uh, the delta method has smaller uh, error, more precision, but the others are less biased. And then we also used, and I think this will please you, as an ultimate criterion, the t-test, which has the better coverage closest to the true coverage, which we did because we had the whole population, so to say, as a model. Yes, uh, well, well, I do like that because, as you know, one of my uh, pet peeves about the survey sampling world is that there's too much of an emphasis on estimates and variances and not enough on confidence intervals. So. Leslie, I wonder if I could uh, go back to uh, some of the uh, design issues that you faced, particularly, you know, you, you were commenting that at the, in the time when you moved to the, the Survey Research Center, there really was very little in the way of probability samples on a nation basis, so that you were really uh, developing a whole lot of new methods and facing new challenges with every study that you got into, I think. And I wonder whether you could tell us a bit about, say, a couple of the early ones as to the kinds of challenges you faced. I would love to do that because really, as being enthusiastic, for how many years now? 
So it's going on to, say, 55 years of sampling. I found it, and I say, young people, there's all kinds of challenging out. Now, let me get you some of the earliest ones. The biggest survey we had at, at Michigan was a survey of consumer finances. It was the largest for us, 3,000 was a large sample for us. And uh, it was rather well financed, it was very complex, including things like uh, getting the extreme income. At that time, $100,000 was a lot of big income. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one person who had over $100,000, and Bro Goodman, and whose home was I, went out and got <coughs> the interview himself. <laughs> and this guy who had over 100,000, he had one in the case. So essentially, we said we really can't get in surveys of this our size that big an income. So there was that challenge. The thing was, there was a probably sample going on in current population surveys. But let's say the social science, sociology, didn't have probability samplers. We were unique. There was an NORC, which is about a couple of years older than we were, but they were using a quota sample and relatively simple statistics, nothing like regressions, okay? So we were on this thing, both in analysis and sampling, ahead of the field. So that's why my consultation would be with Hansen. There were no papers. Uh, for example, when I wrote the paper for American Sociological Review in 57, Confidence Intervals, the editor wanted to know if I'm going to sail into people not taking into account design effects. I didn't call it that yet, but, but this factor, various factors. <coughs> Could I give an example? Well, instead of one example, what I did one went, went through a whole one year's issue with American Sociological Review and found some, some like 60 cases, not one of them. Either they didn't use a problem sample, but the ones that did, did not take into account. There wasn't a single person who drew probability sample, who had complex samples at that time, who knew how to take this variance factors. So we were on the loan. Now, meanwhile, here we are doing regressions, and I'm coming around to your question, analytical statistics, and nobody else was doing it. And that's why I got so excited about the notion of BRR and de develop this method. But the, the, com the survey of consumer finances was big, you Once said, it. but the, the election studies were pretty small at okay. that point, right? Actually, and I'm very proud of that, we were still in Washington when the State Department wanted some samples about uh, reaction to the bikini uh, nuclear uh, was it nuclear or hydrogen bomb? No, it was nuclear. But they didn't have money, so we had a national. We drew it, and then we did a couple of samples. And one of those samples put in a question in 1948, whom would you vote for, Truman or Dewey? Oh, that wasn't the purpose of the survey. No, it was a, oh, that was note. just a side question <laughs> they put in. And it turns out that the Quarter samples are all electing Dewey. And this sample, which had 600 people, adults, we elected Truman. <laughs> and that was one of the big, luckiest feats ever, because <laughs> you know the standard error, so I go through that, we could have elected anybody except Henry Wallace, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very exciting. Let me switch gears a little. While you were doing all this <coughs> research, you were also teaching. Uh, and tell us about the early courses that you were teaching and uh, how those came about and how they evolved over time. Ro Goodman uh, taught the course in uh, in '48, and then he went on the field on a trip to Puerto Rico. Then he came back for a year, and after that, I was teaching for about 50 on. So I was simultaneously teaching a graduate course as a lecturer in uh, social department. And I was a graduate student, and uh, I started writing papers. Now, it took me about 12 years before I got the idea that 
it's not immoral to write papers during the daytime. <laughs> I thought it was, you see, I came from Washington, and I was so busy, I thought papers is something you do at night uh, or at weekends. It was Angus Campbell persuaded me to write up selecting adults in the household as my first paper. I didn't, you know, I said, well, you know, you can see. No, I said, this is, this is worth having. That, that's the thing that became the Kish method. Since then, any time I have a new idea, I give it a good name, like BRR, design effect, so it won't be called the Kish effect. <laughs> so I was teaching, too. And I enjoyed the teaching quite a bit. This was a course in survey sampling. Right? Survey sampling, and there was another one. Survey sampling was the main one, and there was one that was about the theory of the methods. So, more like Hanson Hervis's second volume, that sort of thing, and some of the Cochrane's that didn't get into the f first course. And they were so, in the sociology department. Sociology and psychology always joined, <coughs> but the students came mostly from public health some from statistics, then, and then everywhere else. You asked me before about the survey sampling book. There were some things that were not in the Hanson, Hervis, or Cochran that I could find. I would use one as a main text and others and papers, and I couldn't find. And simply enough, somewhere in the 50s, I started writing some notes that became detailed notes in Puerto Rico on the, I remember, the roof of the Olympo Court Hotel. <laughs> on, I remember certification that became chapter three of the book later on. I didn't have an idea about the book, but some things I felt certification was one, was not treated well enough, simply enough, or enough. So I started accumulating notes for the course. And then, then cats came around somewhere around 1960s, so how about the book for Wiley? And started working, but it took a few years to do it. And when did you start the uh, survey program, the sampling program for foreign statisticians, and, uh, and why did you do that? Thank you. Um, you know I want to get to that. It's something very dear to my heart. Around 1960, I'm a do-gooder, and uh, among other things, sometimes I do better. <laughs> uh, and uh, I said, here I am, I'm uh, doing interesting professional work, and also belong to environmental and peace organizations, and could I do something good in my profession? There was also the example Ro Goodman was going to Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Pakistan, I don't know how many countries the international civil servant, and more or less implying by his example that I was not doing, I wasn't the proper world citizen. So, so how could I do something? And meanwhile, I had students like Jose Nieto de Pascual and a couple of other interesting early examples who came from other countries here for the summer courses. I said, could I do something like that? So my first idea was Latin America, and I got a year's grant from a Stern Family Fund in New Orleans, enough for a year, 30,000, and my, made my recruiting trip to Latin America, beginning with Mexico. So you were recruiting students? I went down to recruit students and made about eight stops, not all the countries. As I think I brought back somebody from every one of those countries. And I would go to, go to the statistical office, for example. But in some countries, several countries, it was the central bank where the most interest was shown in national surveys. I got my first Ford Foundation got grant and got two others after that, about five-year grants. They weren't, gr weren't a lot of money, but I made it go three times as far by getting, I would promise a person that we had a fellowship, and then say, apply now to the United Nations. And mm, 
about three times out of four, we got one from the UN or someplace, some other foundation. Now, when I quit, when I retired, we were up to 90, some countries we were up to, I think, 104. So they had students and colleagues now all over the place. Uh, Did they bring you new problems or new ways of thinking about things? Absolutely. First of all, my motto about teaching is in any class, the aim of a teacher should be that you learn at least as much as the best student, not as much as the sum of the students. <laughs> Hopefully the top of the students learn more than you did. But you should learn in every class. Uh, so many of my, say, the examples and survey samples come from questions in the class. Is this really so? And sometimes it wasn't really so. I forgot some assumption. But still in touch with many of the students. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Some, let's say, Christmas time, I got, say, a couple dozen or a couple score of uh, Christmas cards or letters. My uh, first job, um, which is where I, I, I got to know you a little bit, was at World Fertility Survey, where I believe you were the, well, I know you were the sampling guru for that uh, very large international uh, project. I was an advisory committee, right, you were the and we met about twice a year in interesting places like Kuala Lumpur or uh, Trinidad. Uh, and uh, whose head was Morris Kendall. Morris Kendall. He's one of the greatest men I ever met. Any good Morris Kendall stories? I do. I want to start on that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never finish. He was an amazing person. And those meetings were tremendous. And let me tell you one story then with Kendall, that one argument I lost to Kendall, and she was wrong. <laughs> of course. <laughs> he was very often right. And he was always very confident, I would say. Uh, it had to do with um, the national samples, the size. I was for a compromise between equal size for all countries and well, proportion population. to size. Portion size would be if you want to add them up. And Morris Kendall says, you know, these are national samples. We never add them up. And I said, you, somebody wrong. That was the purpose. And that's where I got the idea of what I call rotating samples, but later on I call rolling samples. I believe that combining or accumulating samples is a coming field on which there'll be conferences and papers because it needs modeling and I think it's a great place for basing things. How do you combine uh, 10 years equal or do you give greater weight? The only weight to the last one, for example, would be one extreme. The other one would be equal weight or the other one is increasing. So what to do? And the, will be very different for different variables. Oh, sure. On the rolling sample, just for a minute, you first uh, wrote about that quite a number of years ago. I'm kind of, I'm blanking as to what the first paper was. But it the was Hawaii, 1979, like that. called it rotating sample. So it, it's taken some time, but it's now... Uh, the ball is the, rolling. Right, the ball <laughs> is rolling with the American Community Survey. And I wonder whether you'd like to tell us what that little buttonhole is. Okay. By the way, I called it first rotating sample in that paper. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that I ran into a small bus saw. People said, this is what we call rotation design. So I needed a name. So in order not to be called Kish Method, I said, all right, here's a word, rolling. And it got translated by now into Hungarian, too. Uh, so, the word rolling, uh, and the translation to French was interesting, Roulant. Uh, now, the Census Bureau, much to my surprise, I didn't expect this, the Census Bureau took it. So that's what they call it, but it's a rolling sample, okay? And Charles Alexander was an ex colleague, so nice enough, they included me, and as one of the 40 or so recipients of this Hammer Award, uh, for which I went to Washington. Uh, so that's what this is, and I'm very proud of this award. Well, 
Leslie, we, we, we thank you for spending some time with us. Um, I can't resist one more question, though. You, you said you've been in Ann Arbor for 53 years and you've worked uh, in the field even longer. If, if, you, if you did it again, would you change anything? Now, as a former student, I, I suspect you may say you'd be on the lookout for better students, but if you could not say that, that would be good. <laughs> what would you do differently? I like to do okay, so it's advice for the next guys, what they could do differently. Now, one, and thank you for asking that question. Um, one of the things I like to advise people to do is even more often than I did, I have some, uh, get young people to write a joint paper with you. Uh, it's a wonderful way of learning. So more often, write joint papers. Why is that? It's the best way to teach somebody uh, how to write a paper. Uh, so that's one thing I would like to tell people to do differently. There's a, another thing that I would do differently. It took me about 40 years to wake up to the fact that design effects is a steadying factor, very important, compared to variances or to coefficients of variations, because it takes out two nuisance parameters which is the unit of measurement and the size of the sample. Uh, so I would do that differently. Another thing I would, I was naive, I think, in 57, when I told the mathematical statistician that what you need is a distribution theory for complex samples. Now, I can say that in one sentence, but there are many things that you can say in a short sentence, like, what is life? to which there is no answer. So I posed the question, I didn't fully realize that there is no good answer to that question. And another one that um, I was pretty good at, but I would tell people not to, is don't waste much time criticizing somebody that used a bad method like water sampling. The way to do things is to do it well. And I must have some time where I can say how happy I am to do this. I don't know if I'm naturally ham, but I have a great respect for the American Statistical Association, and they're willing to do this. You know, founded in 1839, 60 years before the American Physical Society. Would you believe that? Your so pleasure I'm is greatly. exceeded only by ours. Thank, <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. You can learn more about Leslie Kish by reading a paper in the journal Statistical Science called A Conversation with Leslie Kish by Martin Frankel and Benjamin King, uh, and that gives a further uh, discussion of his life.